Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, Senator Matt Klein outlines consumer protection proposals, and Senator Warren Limmer makes the case for establishing carjacking as a crime. Plus, lawmakers advocate on behalf of nurses, and former Governor Jesse Ventura testifies in favor of legalizing cannabis. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. A bill to prohibit the use of conversion therapy, which is the practice of attempting to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, is headed to the Senate floor. During its final committee stop, physician and chair of the Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, Senator Matt Klein, offered his perspective. The history of medical practice is littered with barbaric practices that have left a stain on the profession and on humanity, uh, leeches for infections, uh, lobotomy for psychiatric illnesses, the willful practice of prescribing morphine for hysteria in women. This bill, once in effect, and this practice once eliminated, will join those dark annals of medical history. Uh, as a physician, I'd like to take this moment to apologize to the people of Minnesota who have been victimized by this practice. Senator Matt Klein now joins me in the studio to talk about a handful of consumer protection bills expected to come before the full Senate for a vote. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here. You referred to conversion therapy as a barbaric practice. For some, though, this is a matter of religious faith. Does the bill prohibit a faith leader from counseling an individual, or does it simply prevent this type of therapy from happening in a medical venue? It doesn't prohibit religious consultations whatsoever, and really the only thing we have the power to regulate is licensure over mental health practitioners, and that's what we've done. We said if you hold a license to practice mental health services in the state of Minnesota, you can't advertise or proclaim that you can switch somebody from being gay to straight, because you can't. Uh, so we're going to talk about a handful of other bills. Senator Kelly Morrison, also a physician, is promoting a bill to protect consumers from excessive prescription drug price hikes. Recent outcries over EpiPens and insulin come to mind. Um, but there are quite a few generic drugs that have been around for a long time and suddenly cost a lot more than they used to. Uh, inexplicably, possibly. Without getting too detailed, how would this bill solve some of the problem for these, you know, especially generic drug price hikes? Yeah, the most important part of this bill, there are several mechanisms within the bill to control drug costs for Minnesotans, but the biggest one is just creating a drug pricing affordability board, similar to the Public Utilities Commission, where a group of legislators can investigate if a price of a drug goes up by too much or an excessive amount during a current year, a single year, and then we can investigate that, ask the pharmaceutical company to explain that to us. What was this spent on? Is it justified? And impose penalties if necessary uh, to make sure that that doesn't continue to occur in Minnesota. So I, financial penalties, I assume? Financial penalties, yeah. And in the worst cases, investigations by the Attorney General. Uh, Senator John Marty has been working on the issue of catalytic converter theft for several years now. and. He brought along Joseph Baki, who is a special agent with the Minnesota Department of Commerce. He told the press that Minnesota is number three in the nation for catalytic converter theft behind California and Texas, which is an astounding figure. Uh, what would his bill do to s put a dent in this catalytic converter theft? Well, that's the beauty of the John Marty bill, is that a lot of times when we think about the rising crime in Minnesota, we think about hiring more police officers or increase, increased presence of law enforcement in our communities. But as the special agent shared with us, sometimes just simple practical measures can prevent or deter crime uh, or assist them in prosecuting crime very easily. And this simply requires that if you're in possession of a detached catalytic converter that's not, next, not attached to a car, you have to have the VIN number marked on there, even with just a Sharpie. Uh, and if you have a, a catalytic converter in, pos in your possession and it doesn't have that, you're guilty of a crime. If you have several of them, you're guilty of a felony. Um, so that will deter people from detaching these things and not identifying them. And what law enforcement was telling us is that they would often pull over a vehicle and they would have you know, seven or eight catalytic converters in the back seat, but they had no means to sort of prosecute or investigate that individual. Now they will. 
So if they don't all have the proper VIN number on each piece of equipment, then essentially it's theft. That's exactly right. And the other part of the, the law is that if they present those to a um, scrap shop dealer, a scrap metal dealer, uh, that dealer needs to see not only the VIN on the um, converter, but also the registration for the vehicle that it came off of. So these just simple sort of bureaucratic measures can really prevent crime. Um, another bill that is part of the consumer protection package that you unveiled with some of your colleagues is Senate File 252, and it's authored by a Republican, Senator Rich Draheim. He quoted some stunning t statistics that over 50 billion robocalls are received in the United States each year. Um, and then he, he cited a Pew study from 2020 that said 19% of adults don't even bother to answer their phone anymore because of these robocalls, you know, potentially not taking emergency calls. Uh, so what would his proposal do? How can you stop, especially since so many of them originate overseas, how can you stop that? It's very difficult, but the, the problem is very real, as you've described. People don't answer their phones anymore, and they don't you know, get emergency notifications that maybe they otherwise would. Even while we were hearing that bill, during the process of the hearing, I received two robocalls, which I think is fairly typical for most Minnesotans. So we've got to start finding solutions to go after this problem. This bill is very simple. It just empowers the attorney general to enforce the laws uh, and uh, charge crimes in, to enforce the existing robocall laws that we already have. Will it solve the problem? Probably not, because of that difficulty that we have with a lot of them originating overseas. So we'll, ha we'll have to do additional measures as well, but this is a starting point. Uh, finally, a bill that you've introduced, uh, Senate File 1138, would protect consumers' privacy with direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies. So. I was given one of these tests quite a few years ago, and I took it, and it's been really interesting for me to see, especially as more people have done this, you know, the profile has improved over time. It, it now presumably is more accurate about where my ancestors came from here, and I probably have relatives here, and, and, and all of that. But what is the concern about the data? Can you explain the, the need for this bill? Yeah, so this bill actually came to us from the industry itself. 23andMe and Ancestry are the two big ones. And you're right, a lot of Minnesotans have ordered these kits and spit into the bottle and then get in sort, got, received sort of a genetic profile uh, in the mail. Um, and what's happened then is that subsequently they'll get an email or a call from a third party vendor that says, hey, would you like to find out all the people in Minnesota that you're related to, or would you like to find out this additional data? And once they've agreed to that, then their data is out there in public, and it can be used by law enforcement to investigate crimes, it can be used uh, by advertisers to sort of target advertising to you, Shannon, uh, and that's where things can get a little creepy. Uh, they've actually solved some crimes like the um, mass murderer in California, by sort of tracing relatives who had participated in these things and narrowing it down to this one individual. So what this does, it's a model bill that has already been passed in a number of states, and it just gives the consumer, the person who does the test, positive, affirmative, uh, out of the gate uh, choice in whether they want their data shared with anybody. And then it also gives them the, the option at any point to sort of retract that consent and have their data deleted. So it's a pretty good consumer protection measure. Is it retroactive in that, like, if I decided I don't want my data shared, can I contact them and say, don't share it? Like, I mean, does it go backwards in time? It does. Uh, within those two uh, sort of genetic testing companies, 23andMe and Ancestry, you can say, delete my data and don't use it anymore going forward, and they are obligated to do that. Now, if you've already sort of consented to provide it to a third party administrator or something like that, then there are difficulties there. So mentioning the case that happened in Idaho with the presumed killer, uh, can law enforcement use this even without permission if it could help solve a crime? They cannot, and that's what we've been told. If law enforcement was to approach 23andMe and say something like, you know, we think we have a criminal here and we think these in your database, can you fork over these records? They don't have the authority to do that currently. The way they solved some of those other crimes was by sort of networking close relatives and you know zoning in on it um, but they can't ask for your specific data so we have just a few moments left is there any other bill that that you'd like to mention I'm really excited about the uh, payday lending bill, day, bill that's being introduced by Senator Judy Seberger uh, and that's going to cut down on the interest rates on those payday loans which really are very exploitative and just sort of limit them we can still get payday lending but we should limit uh, how sort of high cost they are to the individual consumer 
So you're talking about like the interest rates then that people are charged. They get a payday loan ahead of when they would normally get paid, and then there's exorbitant fees and interest charges on top to just kind of put a level on that? Yep, put a cap on that so that uh, Minnesotans aren't gouged and digging out of a hole that they can never get out of. And now you're new to the chairmanship, so I just want to just ask you one more thing before we go. Um, why this committee? What's important to you about being the chair of Commerce and Consumer Protection? You know, Commerce touches on almost everything. There's not a single bill here at the legislature that I couldn't call in if I needed to, but I'm really excited because this work of consumer protection has sort of lain fallow, I think, for several years, and it's important work. And the things we've talked about today, you know, payday lending and robocalls and catalytic converters happen to almost every single Minnesotan, and there's things we can do at the legislature to fix that, so we're going to do it. Senator Matt Klein, thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. Lawmakers and nurses advocated for a bipartisan effort to improve the working conditions, recruitment, and retention of Minnesota nurses. Minnesota nurses have raised our voices in the past year about the crisis of understaffing, retention, and patient care. There is a reason for that. The problems in our hospitals are getting worse, not better. Surveys show that half of all nurses are thinking of leaving the bedside in the next year, and that is terrifying. When patients walk into a Minnesota hospital, they shouldn't be wondering if the hospital will have only half the nurses they need to provide the care patients expect and deserve. And the number one reason nurses give for why they are leaving the bedside is short staffing by hospital executives. Last week in violence prevention class, we were practicing self-defense and painless takedowns of assault to patients, and the moral of the story of that class was, you're going to get hit. We'll just teach you how to avoid getting hit in the head where it's going to do less damage. I know many nurses have reduced the hours that they're working because of the stress. Um, and some have just completely left the workforce. They're no, no longer working or no longer working as nurses. I've personally stayed working on the job, um, but not without some serious health consequences that have needed medical care. It's not just about building a pipeline for new nurses, because we know over and over again in the data that nurses come into the profession like I did back in 1985, knowing I was going to take a job that was going to test me, that it was going to be difficult, that I was going to be in precarious situations with the obligation to do my very best to care for the person in my hands. Nurses know that. They know they're not coming into a profession that's easy. But when understaffed, when exhausted, they know mistakes happen. And they are asking for our help. And as policymakers, if our goal is a healthy population and safe patient care, we can no longer ignore, we can no longer ignore the pleas of our professional registered nurses across the state. We can't continue to build the pipeline and have nurses coming into a system that burns them out and sends them out. Staffing is at the heart of the Keep Nurses at the Bedside Act, but violence prevention and nurse recruitment are a big part of that big picture, and everyone agrees on that. This piece of legislation merely sets up committees at every hospital so they can talk about it at a hospital-by-hospital hospital way how to handle these issues. Nurses don't wake up in the morning thinking, I hope I go get to pick at my hospital. I hope I get to threaten a strike. They wake up in the morning hoping they can go serve somebody. My wife is a nurse. The passion that you've heard from the two nurses here, the three nurses here, four nurses, sorry. Uh, the whole crowd behind me, <laughs> surrounded by nurses. Anyway, the, the passion you've heard from them today and the dozens of nurses that have come to me that I've met over my time, this is a 10-year issue or more, is like, we just want to help people. According to police records, there were 33 carjackings in Minneapolis alone in the month of January. Senator Warren Limmer, ranking minority member and former chair of the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee, plans to propose a measure that would establish carjacking as a felony. He joins me now in the studio. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. So what is lacking in current law that would necessitate establishing carjacking as a separate crime with stiffer penalties? What's lacking in current law is the law itself. We do not have a carjacking provision in Minnesota statutes. We have a simple robbery. 
uh, statute, and anytime someone steals a car with the use of a threat of life and limb, um, prosecutors have to use robbery. And uh, that's just not adequate, especially if you want to uh, uh, tighten up or toughen up the criminal sentence. Uh, I believe that your proposal would also involve mandatory minimum sentences based on the severity of the crime. So as you said, these are just being charged as robberies. So if it's carjacking, there would be a mandatory minimum. Uh, I read news reports, in particular a WCCO report from February of last year, that were 755 incidences of carjacking in the Twin Cities in 2021. Uh, last year it was down about 20%, but still remains high. So would those mandatory minimums then also be a deterrent? I'm hoping it would be, but in addition to the penalty, the threat of a severe penalty of incarceration, let's say, you also have to have the assurance that, or the increase the chances of being caught and convicted. And that raises another question with our prosecutors and judges. Uh, prosecutors historically haven't really pursued car theft much in our metropolitan area where it really happens. But nevertheless, uh, the assuredness of getting caught and convicted and then having my bill where it brings in a heavier penalty, I believe would be a severe deterrent for, for um, having this crime stop. Keep in mind, we're, we're talking about not just the theft of a car, we're talking of someone coming up with the threat of losing your life with a weapon and then taking off with it, usually at a high speed, and now that car becomes a weapon in and of itself, endangering a greater uh, group of, of our general population. So it is a serious crime, it should have a more serious uh, penalty on it than just a simple robbery. So I think it's probably important then to note that theft and carjacking are two different things. Now, if it's a parked car and somebody gets in it and takes it, then it's right. theft. But it's what makes it a carjacking? Is it that threat of violence and get out of your car? It's a threat of violence with a driver in the car. Oftentimes there might be a little kid in the back seat um, that may require maybe a more enhanced penalty. I'm investigating that now. Uh, but the threat of violence, and then sometimes there are times when that driver is assaulted or perhaps even killed. And that's where the severity level increases uh, with a, a five-year maximum uh, add-on to the penalty. That same WCCO article that I noted previously um, points out that some, sometimes these perpetrators are under the age of 18. In fact, there was an incident last May at the Capitol towards the end of session. Now, I think that was car theft, but it was a 15-year-old who drove onto the Capitol complex. At one point in 2021, CARE 11 reported the statistic that 75% of carjackings were done by juveniles. So would a tougher law get to the juvenile part of this problem? Well, juveniles are humans too. They're gonna be uh, weighing their chances of getting caught and then facing a deterrent uh, penalty. Uh, by the way, I happened to see when that car crashed into the light pole on the, on the grounds of the Capitol, four kids went scrambling uh, out of it. Police were right there, a helicopter in the sky uh, following it, but nevertheless, uh, I still believe the chances of getting caught, convicted, and then with the knowledge that you're going to be put away for a long time uh, is going to be a deterrent. Now, when we talk about juveniles, they, they're handled a little differently. Anyone under 18, we really do try to give kids a break. We try and steer them in the right direction once they're caught. There's usually... Uh, well, if, if they're not violent, if they're not uh, to the point of being a threat to the public, uh, they, they go through a lot of uh, counseling, they go through a lot of, of uh, they, they still hold a, a penalty or a, a sentence over their head. We want them to change their behavior more than anything else. And after 18, generally they can get a free break and then start an adult life that's really responsible. If you're violent, 
then you fit into an EJJ, extended juvenile jurisdiction. That means that when the state realizes 16 and 17 year olds are mature enough and know what they're doing is a danger to the public, that's when they qualify for that. And then they'll get some time served. Last year, former Senator Paul Gazelka sponsored a similar measure to the one that we're talking about here, and it would have required individuals convicted of carjacking to serve their full term, no probation, no parole. Is that also what you have in mind and why? We're going in that direction, <clears throat> quite honestly. Uh, the penalties are not uh, extremely long, but sometimes you need to have that serious uh, limit. Uh, of the term of when you're going to be incarcerated. Uh, good time doesn't necessarily fit. This is a very serious crime and it's of a high volume. Prior to that 2021 report that you referenced of over 700 carjackings, this, this crime was hardly noticeable. It didn't even put a blip on our radar screen, but now it is and it's, it's taking on a life of its own and it's something that the state must respond to. There was reference in a recent Minnesota Public Radio story about how a federal crackdown is now, you know, taking a bite out of these carjacking crimes. According to the story, the FBI is working with local law enforcement to bring federal charges against carjacker, carjackers because it is a federal crime. So is the goal of putting this in Minnesota statute then so that the FBI or federal officials don't have to get involved so we can tackle this problem right here in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> but it's funny you bring that up. It, this is real, the federal involvement is a reaction that Hennepin County and Ramsey County prosecutors are not even prosecuting the robbery charges. And you have to have a federal U.S. attorney to do the job. That shouldn't be where his focus is on doing local prosecutions. That should be the county prosecutor. In this case, in recent history, those county prosecutors are not doing their job, and they should. If we can write a new law, uh, create an enhanced penalty, it points out to them that the legislature, who represents the public, knows and wants them to pay attention that this is a serious crime, and we want you to administer the policies that we write into law. We only have a minute before time is up. So I'd like to know, I, I would imagine that this is one of several public safety proposals that you will bring. Ideas, yeah. Could you preview maybe one other? Well, first the budget, it's a budget year. So we're gonna be focusing on some of the unfinished work that we did on the budget. Uh, we've got responsibilities in the corrections, uh, public safety, uh, and the judiciary uh, itself. Those are the three areas that we're focusing on. We have this particular bill on enhancing uh, carjacking. And then we've got to visit the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, about 45 years ago, the legislature in their infinite wisdom gave them the authority to change Minnesota law without the legislature being involved. Um, they lowered penalties on probation. They capped probation at a five year term max for all sorts of crimes with the exception of just rape and murder. So things that would be very low up to very high, aggravated assaults, five year max. Um, sometimes individuals that are coming out of prison need to prove to us through probation that they're responsible citizens and sometimes that takes a little longer than five years. So we wanna revisit that whole thing because quite honestly, the only people that are responsible to write law should be the ones that have been given that authority by the public in a voting booth, not bureaucrats that are appointed by a governor. On that note, Senator Warren Limmer, thank you so much. You bet, thank you. A bill to allow adults in Minnesota to recreationally use cannabis is moving through the Senate. Former Governor Jesse Ventura testified in support, and a key Republican lawmaker expressed concerns. First Lady Terry Ventura started suffering from late stage um, seizures, late in life seizures. She was seizing two to three times a week, and these were the type of seizures 
where you can't do anything but comfort the person, make sure they're breathing, make sure they're not swallowing their tongue, everything like that. Our life was over. We went to the doctors. They put her on four different seizure medicines. First one did not work. First two did not work. Third one did not work. Fourth one did not work. All had bad side effects. In desperation, we broke the law. We drove to Colorado. At 18, I went into the United States Navy. 18. I spent one year being trained and became a Navy SEAL. I then deployed to Southeast Asia and Vietnam for a nine-month deployment. While I was in BUDS training, underwater demolition SEAL training, I turned 19. While I was deployed on my first deployment to Vietnam, I turned 20. I returned home. Within one week, I went into my executive officer and I demanded to go back to Vietnam. He looked at me and said, but you just got home, you can't do that. He said, Navy requirements, you've got to be six months out of the combat zone before you can go back in. Then he asked the question, what is the problem? And I said, here's the problem, sir. I said, over there, I'm a man. Here, I'm a child. Today, I suffer a little post-traumatic stress, and it's from that. It's from knowing my country sent a child to war, and it still exists today. So pick your age. Are you an adult at 18? It seems to me you should be. If you are able to go kill for your country or be killed for your country, and you're old enough to do that, you ought to be old enough to smoke a joint. Does this improve safe, public safety on our roads and highways? And, and I think there's no way. And we, we, we fight for zero deaths, the zero, total zero deaths campaign. We try and reduce the number of deaths on our roads. And this is going to turn the opposite. It's not going to help. Uh, so that's my number one concern is, is that. Uh, the testing, we don't have testing in place to do any of this, and it's going to be so many issues, as the sheriff said, economic and our social costs, uh, our kids, this is going to be more acceptable to kids now. So kids, I just heard of an incident at a school the other day where one of the kids brought gummies to school not knowing they were marijuana gummies, and the whole classroom of kids got stoned. And they had to call the ambulance, they had to call the police, they didn't know what to do. Uh, and this is just opening it up for our kids. Uh, the mental health issue, I mean, I just met with the Rice County uh, Chemical and Mental Health Coalition today on a Zoom, and I asked them what do they think this is going to do. This is only going to make things worse. Uh, it, it, it's just going to increase more mental health issues. Um, the expungement issue, you're, you're letting people out for who broke a law, but that was in law, and now we're releasing them. Um, I could go on and on. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.